We've asked each author to give us an interesting fact about herself or himself. I'll tell you what they are, and then after uh, their introductions, just before we ask questions, we'll see who you think each one was. <laughs> one of our authors, as a film major at USC, totally bombed on the Hollywood Showdown television game show. <laughs> one of our authors played the cymbals in ASU's marching band. One of our authors will be on an upcoming episode of House Hunters. Oh, I love that show. <laughs> oh, 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 don't give it away, don't give it away. <laughs> One of our authors can fence, can weld, has lived in England, and will soon be earning a black belt. <laughs> One of our authors actually skydived as re is it sky dove? Don't look, don't look. <laughs> skydived in preparation for a book about skydiving. One of our authors is forever burdened with a rock ground into a finger from a downhill skateboard accident. And one of our authors hails from Canada. <laughs> a, a, a small town, right? Where they make like uh, heavy water, you know, for um, <laughs> what's the <laughs> nuclear bombs? <laughs> okay, let's let's have faith do our introductions. Okay, so I'm gonna start with Tom. So this is Tom Levine. He's written. This is his fifth novel. So he's written random, sick. This is the later. original cover of Random, which will come into play later. So, um, Tom is one of the best YA novelists uh, ever. Um, and he writes some of the best dialogue you will ever read. And his newest book, Random, is the very first young adult pick for Arizona's Arizona Republic's uh, recommend, Republic Recommends article. So, yay, Tom! And then uh, he'll be at the Changing Hands Phoenix store next Wednesday. Wednesday. This coming Wednesday. Yes, Seven. if you want to hear more about the awesome yes. talk. Uh, not to turn my back on Tom, but. <laughs> this is Amy Dominey. Um, she writes Contemporary YA, and this is Matter of the Heart. It's her new book that comes out next May. And it is amazing. <laughs> I read it in one sitting, and it's the type of book that when I got done reading it, I was just, I was just happy. I was just like, oh, it was such a good book. It made me really happy. And it's it's really fantastically well written, too. Uh, this is Amy Nichols, and this is her first book. Um, now that you're here, it is uh, sci-fi, and it is also fantastic. I loved it. As soon as I got done reading that book, I like I had to start it all over again, because it was just so good. I had to like go back, and like there was things I missed. And I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> um, and this is Jeanette Rollison, and Jeanette is, if you want to be a writer, you want to be like Jeanette, because she has been, you got what, 20, 25, 24 books now? Yeah. Overachiever. Right? <laughs> right? So, like, talk about a career in writing. So, um, Son of War, Daughter of Chaos is her most recent novel, and it is also fantastic. It's like a super fun, like, Egyptian adventure story. Uh, I think it's better than with Brighton, but I could be a little biased. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, um, and then uh, that is Shannon Messenger, yeah. and she, um, her latest book is Keeper of the Lost Cities. It uh, Everblaze. Everblaze, thank you. It is the third book in her Keeper of the Lost Cities, which is a middle grade series. Um, so she's got a middle grade series and a YA series, and she's here in town um, for her third book, and it is. So such a super fun middle grade fantasy. And talk about world development. Wow, yes. <laughs> like, she's really great at, at, at developing worlds. And I'll be at Changing Hands Yes, she'll tonight, be at Changing Hands tonight. Actually. Changing Hands Tempe tonight mm. at 7 o'clock. It worked out well. It was like I flew in uh, like two hours ago, and now I'm here. And now I'm here. <laughs> awesome. So it worked out well. And then that, um, in the strip chart is Shauna Slayton, and Cinderella's Dress is her debut novel, and it is a beautiful, beautiful historical fiction about the real Cinderella's dress, oh the real Cinderella. And it's the first 
in a series, or is it just two a book? Two. Two. Um, and it is also, it's fantastic and it's beautifully written. Just beautiful. And I desperately want the dress that's on that cover. <laughs> um, and then at the end is Suzanne Young. And she's also written multiple books, not as many as Jeanette. Um, <laughs> her most recent books are The Program and the Treatment, and they are once again like fantastic dystopian, just beautifully written, really great characters. I love everything about those books. So. Will the real Canadian wave your hand? <laughs> And I've never said A in my life. <laughs> Who bombed on Hollywood Showdown? <laughs> and they rerun it sometimes, which is awesome. Especially because I also had bangs and they were not a good look. <laughs> so I'll get this like random call like, is that you? <laughs> I know. Show, us, show us a symbol move. It's harder than it looks. <laughs> what kind of house are you hunting for? It's me. Oh. <laughs> oh, I can't tell you. Never mind. I signed a confidentiality agreement. So. <laughs> Fencing, welding, living in England, and... <laughs> it's going to take me a while to get the black belt, but... <laughs> Who knows how to jump out of a perfectly good airplane? Wow. <laughs> Show Again, us your open. finger. <laughs> Don't anybody take this the wrong way. <laughs> and who is the Harley riding Sturgis attending native of South Dakota? <laughs> Is, is that everyone? Can we get everyone? Yes. It was fun. Ready for questions? Yes. <laughs> I have a question. What class is this? <laughs> it could be a homeback. I don't know. This is two sections of young adult literature. Okay. So this is this is the same. I took this class, and it's awesome. So, right? This is the yeah, same? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. As a matter of fact, we always we went on a field trip to Phoenix Book Company, oh, and the owners of Phoenix Book Company said, oh, and we have this whole cardboard display of a famous author who's just taking YA by storm. His name is Tom Levine. And I said, and we have Tom Levine. <laughs> and he signed all the books. It was like 30 books or something. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> So what's everybody studying? What are you guys here to be? Teachers mostly, or Just other stuff? Writers, writers, writers. Okay, writers, writers. okay. Writers. let's start the, who's, who's gonna be, whose goal is, is to make a living? Anybody got a few who will admit And then who are the, who are the teachers? I'm not disillusioned. Okay. I'll, I'll be the John Lewis. <laughs> I will be the cynic. Okay. So, also, so that well, that helps us know where you guys are at, so what we can help out with. So, okay. Go. I have a question. Um, when you guys sit down to write a book, do you have, like, this, like, when you sit down, you're like, okay, this, I have my story of the beginning, the middle, the end, or, you know, however you're writing it, but do you know, like, the whole thing, or do you make it up as you go, or is it, what's your process? I do not usually know the whole thing. I don't know the end. I till I get there. I think I know the whole thing, but then as I'm writing it, it always changes. Yeah, I always suggest to people that you 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 know the main character, the main character's problem, because just about every book or movie you ever watch is about a character who has a problem, their goal to overcome the problem, um, some obstacles that are going to happen, and um, and the consequence of failure if they don't get their goal. Because if there's not a consequence of failure, then why does it matter? But if you know those things, then you usually have enough to write the book, and, and things change as you, they always do. No matter how well you think you have it, it, it changes. Yeah, I, I can't outline because about like 
three days into drafting, the outline has like gone out the window. <laughs> but I do, um, I, I, have, I use the screenplay term, I know my reversals. So I know when I'm gonna like reverse my fortune for my character, either for good or bad. But I don't always know the exact order of how that's going to be. But I know what I'm gonna take away and what I'm gonna give back. And then I, I do have to know my ending, only because my books are like really, really long. <laughs> and so this is 624 pages middle grade. Um, and so if I didn't have my ending in sight, it would probably be 800 pages. So I have to sort of know where I'm driving before I can really start. I have about five or six key scenes that I know will happen throughout the novel, and as long as I know this, 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 then I can get from here to here, and from here to here, and from here to here, and that keeps me going. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way. I know how it's going to end. Um, that's usually why I write the book, is to get to the point that I wanted to make at the end. Um, probably the last thing I write is the beginning, because I, I kind of never know when to start. <laughs> but I know where I want it to end. I have a question for the series authors. Did you, is, does your answer apply to the whole series as well, or individual books? I, I definitely know where the whole series is going, but there's certain details of it that I don't know, like the like the reactions between the characters and stuff. I don't fully know what's going to happen there, but I know what the villains are going to do and what the you know the good guys are going to do and that sort of thing. Because I felt like I had to, otherwise, how could I set up for it? Yeah, I actually wrote them all as standalone novels to start, and then after I sold them, they asked me to make them into series. So it was kind of <laughs> so I, I got to have you know a whole story, and then uh, try to figure out how to go back and fix what I had done. That was <laughs> fun. That's <laughs> fun. Um, so yeah, I haven't had the opportunity. I, I think I would probably do it a little differently if I knew it was going to last over a few books. But what, what are we doing, Doctor? Yes, choose a question. <laughs> <laughs> These are questions from the students. Oh, okay. Oh. You guys are so shy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when and when or how did you decide you wanted to become an author, and did you have an aha moment? Um, I decided about not quite ten years ago, less than ten years ago, I was in a crappy job, because that helps motivate you a lot. Uh, and I honestly didn't start out to have a career, I just realized I really want to have a book on the shelf, I want to go into a Barnes & Noble or a Changing Hands or whatever and say, look, there's my book, yay! Uh, and, and it built into something a lot bigger. I did not expect this to, I didn't expect to be here today, for example, um, just sort of happened. So there was a bit of an aha moment, I, I suppose, but I also start, started writing in second grade writing fiction second grade and never really stopped. So even if I hadn't been published, I would still be writing fiction. I would just be a lot slower. <laughs> <laughs> Faith? Is that, this is for everybody, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. Uh, <clears throat> now, I'm, same sort of thing. I started writing when I was little. Always loved writing. I, um, maybe the, I worked as a, I tried, was trying to figure out a way to make money and write, so that was like a really hard <laughs> idea. Um, I ended up working as an advertising copywriter for a lot of years, so that was a great job because you could be creative, and, but you know, after a while, I was like, all right, I want to try to see if I have ideas on my own instead of like pitching you on like, you know. <laughs> Sorry, I've foot powder or whatever. I have another question. I have another, on, on top of it. First of all, did anybody else have a writing job that was not fiction before this? Okay, so so did I. Would you recommend that for our aspiring writers or no? Because I verge on the no. What was your job? <laughs> I, I also did uh, copywriting um, and a lot of articles for like vitamins and stuff. It was, <laughs> <laughs> but it was a lot of writing. And so you get you work for eight hours, write, 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 and then you go home like, yeah, write a book. No. Not <laughs> so okay, I, tend, yeah. I tend to veer no. What do you guys think? Well, I would say that it does kill your other writing because after a day of writing, you don't want to come home and write. So. Yeah, it was not good for fiction, but uh, my job for a long time was really creative. I was making commercials and radio, and it was weird. I did the anti-tobacco campaign for the state, and so I had I was in a good place doing good work. So for that, I I would say advertising was you know I would I wouldn't say don't go that direction. My my story is similar. I wanted I wrote stories as a kid, and then um, right after college, I got a job as a tech writer, which is like press enter <laughs> to screen and it was boring um, I eventually got uh, laid off my company the company I worked for went under and we got laid off um, and I whined to my husband for a long time I want to be a writer and he'd say well write something and I'd say no, no that's too scary <laughs> so I did a whole bunch of other careers I worked at the legislature I was a web designer um, finally my husband said okay stop whining take a year see if you can do this 
and so I did, and it worked, and I, yeah. So it was a long time dream that I put off, so I was too afraid. Um, I've always liked writing, and so it was something I always wanted to do. And as a young mother, when I would um, have a chance to, to either say mop the floor or write, I would go, you know, I'll just write. So, <laughs> sort of the aha thing for me. Um, but because a lot of you are going to be teachers, I'm going to tell you why I went into young adult, and that was because I had a daughter who really loved reading, and um, and so we would try and read books together, but then pretty soon she outpaced me, and um, so she would end up telling me what books I would like instead of the other way around. And when she got to seventh grade, she finally got to have a language arts class where they, you know, it's just books, and I thought, oh, she's gonna love this, and she's gonna be reading the classics, so it'll be, you know, I'll be able to talk with her about those books again, and um, I thought she was gonna love it, and actually she hated that class because they read um, My Brother Sam is Dead, Grapes of Wrath, Across Five Aprons, and Frank's Diary. Like, every book was depressing. <laughs> and, um, and so then she started this, this other book, it was Frankenstein, and, um, and she said, does somebody die in this book? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And she shut the book and she said, if I didn't already love reading, my teacher would make me hate it. And that statement just sort of stabbed me in the heart because I thought, what about all those kids in that class that didn't love reading when they went in? You know, are they going to want to pick up a book um, after this class? So I thought there needs to be light, fun books. So, um, you know, that's kind of why I went into young adult, and you know, all these years later, I'm I'm still there. It's funny because um, by the end of high school, I didn't read anymore for that very reason because I, I was always just given the college reading list and told read these, and they were really long and really boring and really depressing, and I hated reading by the end. Um, I was. Also, I, I mean, I, I enjoyed writing, but I actually was really sidetracked by art. I, I was an art major for one semester, just long enough to realize that um, I don't have the same talent level of talent that the other students had, and so I sort of had to realize art will be my hobby, art will not be my career. Um, and so I took a class on a whim. I took um, broadcast writing and production, largely because it sounded like the kind of class where I would get to get um, college credit for watching TV, and it was. <laughs> but we did have to um, write a full script for a, a one-hour TV show of our own creation. I, would, I started college really young. I was 16. I was one of those. And, um, <laughs> I, when I turned in my final project, my teacher, when, instead of giving it back to me with a grade on it, it had a note that said, see me in my office hours. And I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> and um, instead, when I went to meet with her, what she had for me was film school brochures. So that was sort of my first aha moment. It was like, ooh, you can like major in film and television? And she had the USC film school brochure, and she said, it's number one in the nation. If you want to do it, do that. And I was like, all right, done, goal set. And I worked really, really hard for two years to get into USC film school. <laughs> got to USC film school and sort of realized two things. One, oh, I'm gonna have to do more than write. I'm gonna have to like make films, which should have occurred to me, but didn't. They said, I walked literally first day of class. Your first film will be due in three weeks. And I went, I'm sorry, am I in the right class? <laughs> I thought I was just here to study writing. Um, and so I spent the next two years and then a year after graduation sort of having lots of aha moments that I hated Hollywood. It just wasn't for me. So my real aha moment was actually Project Book Babe. Um, I had walked away from Hollywood, taken the practical day job and just decided to have that be my life. And I really missed writing um, and so I thought Maybe I should do it, but I was terrified that I was going to have another film school fiasco, that I was going to do all of this work and write the book and publish it and then hate it. And so I had been following Shannon Hale's blog, and she posted about Project Book Babe, and I saw that the lineup had everyone from, you know, at the time, Lainey Taylor was just starting out to Stephanie Meyer and this huge range of authors. And I was really curious about the fact that they were all getting together to raise money for this woman, for not, no offense to you, but she didn't seem super important. Because in Hollywood, like that wouldn't happen unless it was Steven Spielberg or something, you know? Like, I know, this sounds horrible, but, but you know, I kept thinking, okay, so she, oh, she works at a bookstore, but that's not, she doesn't put you on the New York Times list. She, does, she can't make your career. 
and they're still rallying around, I want to understand this industry. And so I went and I found out that this was exactly what I, I wanted people who would just help somebody because she was amazing and she could talk about your book in a way that makes your book sound so much cooler than it is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they say that moment of like you find your tribe, that was Project Book Babe for me. I just kept listening to everything they said. I was like, this is my tribe. These are my people. The, and Jeanette was up there and I mean, it was just like, I was sitting there going, this is finally the spot where I belong. I want to be with those people. I want to be up on that stage answering questions like that. So it's really surreal to be sort of sitting there with some of you guys in this moment. That was my big, and I went home from Project Book Babe and I started writing Keeper. And that's why actually Everblaze is de um, dedicated to faith because Aww. it would not happen. sound like she's not important. She's very important. <laughs> she, she has had a book dedicated to her, um, and I have a lot of family members that have not had books dedicated <laughs> to them. Yet. So, and I don't care. She deserves it. <laughs> it's funny. Um, my aha was probably fifth grade. I had a fantastic teacher who read books out loud to us every single day. I can't remember all the ones that she read. I know she read The Hobbit and she read Watership Down. And it was after Watership Down that I finally went, oh, this is killing me. And I wrote my own fan fiction. It wasn't fan fiction at the time. I thought it was being original. <laughs> my story about rabbits and the danger and all that. And never stopped writing. But I never believed that I could actually, I couldn't be one of those people. They, I thought they were just amazing and so high above me. and. But I wanted to contribute to the book world because I just love books so much. And so many years later, many jobs later, uh, my writing job was uh, also a tech job. I wrote computer help files. And yes, that was boring writing. <laughs> and it was hard to go home and write fiction. But I do think it's a good job to have to get you started writing. The, the discipline of sitting down at your computer and writing is hard. Just to get those words out of you. And mm -hmm. so having a job where they pay you to do that will help you develop those writing skills. But, uh, lost my train of thought. So yes, the oh, that's why I lost my thought, I was blocking it. The many years of rejection is, is just hard to plow through, but eventually, this past summer, I got to look up. Yay. Uh, I started writing in middle school, I used to write murder mysteries, starring all of my friends, and like, kill them off one by one. And everyone loved it, they were like, can you please kill me next? And I'm like, okay. Um, and, uh, and so I was going to go to school to be a teacher. Um, I was a terrible student, though, and had terrible grades, and so um, they wouldn't let me into the teaching program at the time. I'm actually a teacher now, but they wouldn't let me into the teaching program. So I was like, well, I like to write, and let me do creative writing. And um, it was just such a great experience, and I loved learning that, you know, a lot of the different, a lot of different aspects of literature that I hadn't really thought of um, when I was reading. And so after that, I became a teacher, and I was a teacher for a few years um, out here. And then I moved to Oregon, and I didn't work for a little bit, and there was just so many trees, and it was uh, so lonesome. And I was like, I think I'm going to write some friends, because I can't seem to make any. And so I started to write in that way. Um, and that was my aha moment, because I found uh, people online who also wanted to be writers. And I didn't know how to publish a book. I had no experience. I didn't know any writers. And I found this uh, site, and I showed them, you know, a chapter, and then they'd write back and say, "Where's the next chapter?" And I was like, "I wasn't gonna write one. I was just doing whatever." Um, but having them want to read the book was what made me keep writing it, and so. Um, that's what I did for a while until I got a book published. And then I became that teacher who makes the kids read Frankenstein because I love Frankenstein. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I love Frankenstein. Um, no, but, uh, but I love teaching too because it's kind of like, um, I love to inspire. So I don't want to be the one who kind of kills the love of reading. I want to inspire the love of reading. And so one of the main things I do is I try to find a book for each kid that I know is going to like make him realize like reading's fun. Like it doesn't have to be this terrible thing. Like who cares what you want to read as long as you want to. Um, and so, but I did find like using the creativity in that day job kind of made it a little hard to use the, you know, the creativity outside. So I, I wrote all the time on my breaks and stuff. But, but yeah, that was my Questions, or do we go to the bowl? <laughs> Questions! Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, when you sit down to write YA, what do you have in mind knowing that like this this is geared towards young adults as opposed to when you sit down to write, or in the past, I guess, when you sat down to write um, fiction for adults? 
<laughs> my wife is brilliant, and we, uh, just a statement of fact. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we were going, we saw, it was like Spider-Man 2, or it was some sequel in a superhero movie. And I, as we were driving home, I was like, you know, I was good, whatever, but I really like the, I tend to enjoy the first in the series, whatever it is, whether it's X-Men, Spider-Man, I don't really like that, just really why? Well, because I love origin stories. If you're familiar at all with comic books, origin story is a big thing. How did Wolverine become Wolverine? How did, you know, so-and-so, whatever. And she goes, oh, that makes sense, that's what you write. And I was like, oh, sweetie love, no, 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 no. I, I write young adult contemporary fiction, not superhero films. You're, you're so clearly wrong about this. And then she said, um, I didn't say it like that. Uh, and she, she, and she said, well, but but what is high school if not your origin story? It's like, oh, mic drop, look at that. <laughs> and she's right. It's particularly all of adolescence, but for me specifically, that sort of junior high to high school thing, you are in the process of figuring out who in the hell you're going to be for the next, you know, 80 years or however long. Um, so what I think that's the main thing I keep in mind now when I'm starting anything is this is the origin story. This isn't, this is not a character who's paying a mortgage, you know, God willing, um, and things like that. So what are are those issues? What are those things that this particular that an adolescent is going to be um, looking at? What is her or his origin story? Yeah, I guess. I, I, yeah. Um. <laughs> Tough one to follow. <laughs> There's not a whole lot of like rules. I think about what YA is or has to be, other than you know the only thing that someone ever told me was it has to be about somebody who's a young adult. You know. 14 to 18, you know, you, the main point of view character is the young adult. And actually, I've read a lot of books that I don't even think follow that. Um, so it, I think that YA can be, uh, you know, I don't say to myself, well, this has to be educational, or this is going to need to have a message, or this this is going to, it's just, yeah, just being that, I, I, I think I write YA for the same reason that Tom was talking about, is, you know, that, that question of who do I want to be, and, 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 where do I fit into this world? That's sort of the stuff that interests me, and that is, I think, the journey of a lot of YA books, whether they're fantasies or realistic or, you know, um, slasher, dystopian, whatever. So that's that's sort of where I start to from that place. Yeah, I, um, I have a master's in literature, and when I sat down to write, I thought I had to write literary stories that were very deep and brooding and they were all adults and I would get to about page 50 and I was bored out of my mind. <laughs> so then um, I started like trying to write stuff that I was interested in. All my characters were younger and I and they and they were exciting and I um, I would throw in magic or there would be ghosts or like fantastical things and, and I was enjoying it. So that's what I stuck with and I, I think for me the thing is everything is when you're younger everything is new and you're experiencing things for the first time, and you don't have a lot of the baggage that you have when you're 40. <laughs> and life is sad, and you have a job. And I, don't know. So I just think, don't, don't tell them that. Sorry, it's, it is rainbows. And kids. <laughs> no, I just, I think, I, don't know, I, I just gravitate to like age 15, age 16. Maybe that's something about my psyche. I don't know, but that that's fun for me. I wanna, I wanna live there. So that's why I write it. We never really grew up. I think is <laughs> yeah. As I have written some adult books, and I, I think there are some differences. Um, one, I think YA has to be better written. It has to be more concise and tight, and because adults will give you a little bit of slack, um, and kids won't. You have to catch their attention right away because this is the Nintendo generation, and they have the attention span of fruit flies. So <laughs> you got to get them right away. Um, I, one of the things I like, I've read a lot of romantic comedies, is that things will embarrass teenagers so much more than adults. Like, for example, in one of my um, books, I have a scene where the mom takes the girls to the mall and she's talking about going bra shopping. And this, if, if you're a teenage girl, this would be a horrifying experience to hear your mother say those words in front of your friends. Whereas, you know, adults, you know, it, it's so, we, we get a lot less phased, I guess. So for a humor angle, I really like young adult that way. Um, I, I used to say that as far as violence goes, like the publishers didn't want your character shooting people with guns, which was kind of tricky if you have a situation where the most logical thing to do would be to shoot somebody with a gun, but because that's not really the message we want 
to give young adults, but after having read Divergent, I don't know, maybe that's, you can shoot people with no rules. No. No. So yeah, um, I also, for my young adult books, I don't have swearing in them, um, and that's because I know that they're gonna go in libraries at schools, and um, some people will have a problem with having the books there if they have that you know, more adult language. Um, I have yet to have anyone write me though and say, I really liked your book, it could have used more swearing. But that, that's, those are the kind of differences that I've found in the genres. Yeah, I um, considered writing a grown-up book for about two seconds and then realized I'm so not mature enough for that. So I'll talk a little bit, because I'm sort of the weird one at the table who does both middle grade and YA, so I'll talk a little bit about the difference between those two for me. Um, I, a writer who was much smarter than me, who I'm not even smart enough to remember their name, um, said that middle grade is sort of all about the character trying to figure out where they belong, because that's sort of what middle school is. You're sort of you leave the small little nest of elementary school and you enter this bigger world of middle school and, and you, you, your friend dynamic changes and you're just sort of trying to figure out where you sort of fit in. And YA and, and teenage gem is a lot more about trying to figure out individually who you are and how you sort of stand out from the masses. And so that's sort of been the two themes that I sort of explain or explore in my books. You know, in, in this series, Sophie is very much just always wanting to try to fit in and belong and not stand out. And in um, my other series, my YA series, the characters are very much like, these are the roles that we've been put into and I'm not necessarily happy with that. And that, it wasn't something that I did intentionally, that was just sort of my take on it. Um, and either way, when I'm trying to sort of get in the mindset, um, I try to focus on how big everything feels when you're a kid. Everything feels so much, you know, like if you get a teacher that you don't like, in college versus when you get a teacher that you don't like when you're six, it feels like the end of the world. And my characters are 12, but I mean, you know, you figure if you have a teacher that you don't like when you're 12, and it's, oh, well, it'll only be for a year, that's one twelfth of your life. <laughs> I don't even remember like the first three years of that. So it just feels like it's never going to end. You know, your best friend doesn't sit at your lunch table and it feels like I can never go back to that school again. I just can't, you know? And so trying to get in that mindset and remember how huge everything feels. And then for teenagers, how strong emotionally everything feels, I think it's so funny that so often YA books will get criticized for, they, they call it sort of the insta-love phenomenon, like, have you met teenagers? <laughs> it's like, that boy is cute and he smiled at me and I think I love him and he's all I can think about. And I mean, they don't, they don't necessarily believe that it's real love, but they definitely, that boy is now on their mind and that is what they're thinking about. And so I just try to remember from my own experiences and uh, it helps that I'm really a big kid that I can sort of, I'm very in tune with my inner child and my inner teenager. Please don't ask me to write an adult book. It would never happen. <laughs> I just like reading YA novels. I've never tried to write a grown-up novel either. I, I, they just seem boring to me. I don't, know. <laughs> I don't read them either. <laughs> Thank you. I've read a few, but um, I mostly read YA. Uh, you know, we're talking about different conventions, and, and I came up against one with mine. Um, if you look, most YA novels are, have 17-year-old protagonists. And my novel, when I submitted it, it started out, she, at the very beginning, she's having a birthday, so technically she's 13, turning 14. And before I signed the contract, they asked me if I would age her up. And I said, sure, okay, I'll age her up. Where's the contract? <laughs> <laughs> and I figured they had a plan. Of how, and their plan was, you, could you age her up? I'm like, okay, how do you want me to do this? And the problem I had is that I'm also using history. And so I have a starting point in history and I have an ending point in history and my character ages a certain amount. So I'm like, okay, do I, if I make her 17 here, she's gonna be like 21 at the end of the novel, which puts her into new adult. So what do you wanna do? <laughs> and uh, so we ended up being kind of squishy and I don't know, Faith, what you thought of this. We sort of took away a lot of the date markers, so I have a series of letters and we took up all the dates so that it's sort of, you can't really tell exactly how old she is. Which it's a little ambiguous and I think that that works. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I didn't know how else to deal with it because like I said, because I'm, I couldn't change history. So I, I had to have this and I had to have this and that's what we worked with. But I thought it was interesting that they really wanted her to be 17. 
yeah, mine are 17. Yeah, mine <laughs> too. Like now they think about how much else they are. Um, when I first started writing, I actually didn't know that I was writing young adult. I was just writing a book. Um, I didn't know that it was young adult until someone bought it as young adult. Um, and then I realized that was because of my voice, not so much because of what I write. Um, I write books with you know, passionate love stories set inside a suicide epidemic. So um, I definitely have, you know, dark, uh, dark and dreary. <laughs> That's me. Um, I write, you know, the darker stories, but I just write them as a story. Um, and I think being, you know, having written, you know, several books, you kind of know the business and, and what is going to be okay and what they're going to push back against. So, so that kind of guides you a little bit. But for me, it was always just about telling the story and I didn't really care who, um, who the audience was at the time that I was writing it. Um, so, uh, yeah, just write a good story, and someone will tell you to take stuff out if it's inappropriate. <laughs> just to, sorry, <clears throat> just to piggyback on what sort of everybody said, from a bookseller slash book buyer slash reader standpoint, I think the most important thing about whatever you write is you need to be authentic. Your readers can tell, if you are trying to write a message book, um, your readers can tell. Uh, even if your editor can't, even if the publisher can't, which sometimes they can't, um, <laughs> your readers can tell and, and they won't like your book and they won't finish it. Um, and they won't then recommend it. I mean, especially with YA and middle grade, it's all word of mouth. I mean, especially when you're 16, are you gonna listen to your mom and your librarian? No, you're gonna listen to your friends and read what they're reading, um, whatever they're discovering. But regardless of what age you're writing for, you, the story has to be authentic and it has to be authentically yours. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, you can't write, you can't write towards a trend. You know, it just doesn't, your readers can tell. I was just curious about all of your relationships with your editors and publishers, like whether or not they're positive or negative, and you know, if they've made changes to the books that you've had on now that you don't like, that you're not comfortable with, or like just kind of those, is it a power struggle, or is it a pretty harmonious relationship? Maybe if you turn the camera, just kidding. <laughs> I'll start. Go, yes, please. Um, I, I've, been, I've been with Penguin, HarperCollins, and now at Simon & Schuster. It was a completely different relationship with each uh, each publishing house, but um, I always got along great with my editors. Um, I don't know if they'd buy your book if they didn't like it, so usually if they're the one that bought your book, like they're super into it. <laughs> like They really like it. And I only had problems when um, early on in my career when I got a different editor like mid book because um, that sometimes happens editors leave and then you're kind of like the leftover child that someone scoops up and they're like yeah we're gonna go a different direction with this book and you're like well mm -hmm. um, so yeah but otherwise I, yeah I think it's, it was, it's a great working relationship for me at least. Uh, the company that I was published with is fairly young they're only three years old so they are still kind of a tight-knit, rah, rah, rah kind of group. I go directly to my editor. I don't have an agent, so I don't have an intermediary. And she's always very responsive. I send her an email. Usually by the end of the day, she's answering it. And uh, I got to meet her um, a couple months after the book. I guess, no, the month after the book was published. And we just had a good time. It's like you get to see each other face to face. And it's a very friendly relationship. Yeah, I've been very lucky. Um, Suzanne and I actually currently have the same editor, and she's sort of like, it's almost like she has a superpower. I don't really understand. <laughs> and I hear all of these people, like other friends of mine, they'll talk about, you know, oh yeah, so I turned in my draft, it took me like nine months to get my edits. I'm like, it takes my editor like nine hours. I mean, I really, I so don't fast. understand. She's so fast. I mean, my deadline is like, what day is she going to read it? And then I turn the book in, and then she reads it that day, and and gets me feedback, which does have a downside, because then I'm like, no, I don't want to have to revise it. Like, please, take your time, please. Really, let it be your problem for a little while. Um, and we also think a lot alike. I mean, we, she, she's really into superheroes, so she calls us the Wonder Twins. And it's sort of scary sometimes how I can, especially now that I've been working on her with, with her for five books, I can hear her in my head as I'm writing, and I can hear, she's not gonna let me get away with this. Like, I have to change this now, because that's gonna show up in my edit letter anyway. So, and my edit letters have been getting shorter and shorter and shorter per book because I can hear her in my head. So I, I think that's a good thing, but I don't know, or maybe it's proof that like she's taking over my mind. <laughs> she really does have superpowers, in which case, <laughs> um, I've 
worked with a lot of different publishers also, and, and usually my relationships with my editors are, are very good. I had one who um, I inherited when my first editor left, and she just took forever to get back to me, which was a problem. I mean, communication was horrible. But um, besides that, really good. Some editors I found are like obsessive, compulsive, micro, you know, go through it with a comb. And other ones just kind of give you really general, you know, and sometimes you're like, did they read this part? There's you know, nothing on here. Um, but yeah, I think, I think yeah, they, they're, they're nice, wonderful people for the most part who love books, and that's why they got into the, the industry. Um, this is my first book, and I'm currently working on copy edits for the second book. Um, so I only have one, and our relationship is only a couple years old. Um, I love my editor. She is very kind. She's never domineering. She always says, these are my suggestions. You don't have to do them because it's your book. And I, but I really think this is a team effort. She and I work well together. Um, she is so smart. And, he, and there's a lot of science in my book. Um, so anytime I ran into science issues, she would help me kind of work them out. I'm not a scientist. She could be. She's a um, So I just, I really, I really like her. She said she wants to keep working with me, which is awesome. Um, yeah, I think it's been great. Well, I, my first book sold uh, to an uh, editor named Stacy, who I really loved Stacy. Um, we worked great together. She gave me, I think what's a good editor, they respond to you um, quickly. They respond to you at all. They, <laughs> they listen to your worries. They listen to your concerns. They give you suggestions for revisions without, you know, in a way that you can understand, in a way that says they know what you're trying to write about, and they're not trying to change that. They're just trying to bring your characters maybe more to life or you know so all those are really really good things about Stacy and actually Stacy is now Shauna's editor because she left my um, walker where I was and went to that um, Entangled. went to Entangled and so then I discovered what a not so good at, um, editor <laughs> does uh, and I think she was a fine editor for other people but um, I, there's a difference between the editor that chooses you and the editor that is chosen for you um, and a not so good editor does not reply to your emails or your um, questions. Uh, maybe eventually gets to them, but um, a not so good editor puts your book out without actually having read all of it. Oh, ouch. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Can I have a group hug? Yeah. Please? <laughs> a not so good editor changes the date that your book comes out and doesn't mention it to you. Um, I mean, I can, there was a whole wow. lot of lot of stuff like that. So, I think this doesn't happen much because, like I, uh, maybe Suzanne said, you know, generally you're with an editor because they chose your book because, and so they love your book and so they're wonderful. But in this business, I had no idea before I started. But editors move around more than I ever knew, and you can find yourself sort of. A floater, uh, and that's not such a good place to be. But, but for the most part, and like I said, I think she's a great editor for the for the authors that she's chosen. But that was not something I expected to ever. Um, was that on the No. So then um, I'm no longer with that house. <laughs> <laughs> new editor for this book. New, new um, with Random House, and and this editor, Krista, seems super wonderful. We're we're new. This is you know, but yeah, all good. <laughs> I've had three editors, two of whom were fired, one of whom quit. I have no editor currently except the guy who's going to shepherd book six into bookstores next year, so we don't really have a relationship. Um, I've been with my agent since the beginning, although she is my second agent technically. Uh, and yeah, I would second everything everybody's saying. It, editors and agents in particular, they, you don't get into this business to make money. Have you all figured that out? <laughs> um, so you get into it because you love what you're doing, uh, whether you're an author or an editor or an agent for that matter, because they're not getting paid either. Um, so you do it because you love it. So those relationships, I think, yeah, generally, they tend to sway pretty positive. Marketers? <laughs> if you want to worry about something, worry about those guys. <laughs> worry about editors and agents, because they will, they will accept you and take you and bring you in and bring you up and raise you and take good, good care of you because they love you and they love your work. Marketers do not care. <laughs> and that's a whole other day. I'll stop there. So, um, sorry, I also yeah. do editing. Um, I've edited books for April and Pike and uh, Barry Liga, as well as others. Um, yeah. <coughs> Um, I've edited a couple of Tom's books. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know that. I knew. <laughs> oh, God. Um, oh, God. 
So a good editor, um, there's this quote that some, I heard at a book signing that an author did many years ago, um, that a good editor helps you write the book you meant to write. Isn't that mm, what it is? It's the, you, the, the book you thought you wrote the first time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a good editor helps you write the book you thought you wrote the first time. Um, and from an editor standpoint, that's really, like that's what we do. Our job is to make you the best writer that you can be and make your story the best writer that the best story that it could be and make your characters the characters that will just live inside people's heads and inside people's minds we want your book to be the type of book that we get that your readers get done reading and then they're just so happy or that they have to read over and over again or they have to read a million times or can't stop talking about that's our job and um, sometimes it's it's easy depending on the book and sometimes it's not so easy um, our favorite as an editor my favorite clients are clients who take editorial direction very well <laughs> um, but yeah it's it, the key is really just to find a really good editor that you can work with, whether they're slow or fast, as long as it's, you know, a good, cohesive relationship. That's all that matters, I think. Okay. <laughs> yeah. How does the process of editing work exactly? Like, do you just sit down and read the book and you're like, no, that's not, I don't like that. No. <laughs> How I do it, yeah. So I don't do, I do content editing, I don't do copy editing okay. because I am not very good at grammar either. <laughs> so that is not my, that is not my forte. Uh, that's what's special. I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> I am really bad at commas, I'm just saying. Um, so uh, I sometimes call myself like a story therapist too. So like my, that's great. right, my job is to make the story the best that it can be so yes I do read it and uh, I, I will read it uh, my process is I will read it the first time and I'll make notes as I go and then I'll look at my notes and, I, and then I'll read it like I'll read a book three or four times um, depending on, on you know how big it is and, and the characters and stuff um, and then I'll go back and I'll make sure that my you know you know what I was really thinking made sense because sometimes I'll just make notes like you know this didn't make sense and this didn't make sense but then like three chapters later it's explained and so I just make sure that my notes for my own self are cohesive um, but yeah I mostly just make note you know and I I make suggestions for you know expanding a character or cutting a character or you know cutting an entire plot line or um, you know whatever I think is gonna make the story the best that it can be. I know I keep saying that, but um, and I, I mostly do YA. I've done a couple of adult stuff, um, but YA in middle grade tends to be my and picture books tends to be um, easiest and, and most fun for me. But yeah, that's how we do it. And then I talk it over with people. You know, I talk it over with the clients and I say, these are my suggestions. This is what I think is going to be. And um, part of the reason why I call myself a story therapist is there have been times where um, I've talked to my clients and in the process of talking I have changed completely where I wanted them to take the story and then we go in a completely different direction um, my favorite wa was this girl um, she was writing it was sort of like the spy fantasy thing and I had her like the main plot point I had her cut completely and focus on this smaller sort of plots you know storyline because that's really where she as a writer that is where she wanted the story to go and so it's a matter of it's a good communication um, and then I just take lots of notes for myself and uh, yeah can, can I add something I know there are a couple of people who want to be writers in here when it comes to your relationship with your editor um, be gracious about taking those notes um, Sometimes your ego can flare up. You'd be like, no, I mean, this is perfect. And you know what? It's not. <laughs> so um, just be willing to, to, you know, take in their, their ideas and consider them. You don't have to take all of them and, and do them, but just know that you can always improve. And to the, the less walls you have between you and your editor, the better I think the relationship is. Yeah, and I was just going to add, um, I have learned that it's always about getting down to the spirit of the note. 
Um, a lot of times, especially with these books, um, I actually have to send my editor a separate file called the What's Really Going On file because these, these books are a shell game and so a lot of people aren't who they say they are and things aren't what they say. And so I always have to give her that to be like, just so you know, so you, but in your edits. But also, even with my other series, which is more straightforward, a lot of times it's like, she doesn't know my characters as well as I do. She doesn't know what I want as well as I do. So a lot of times, her specific suggestion my back will sort of go up and it's like, no, that won't work, that won't. But I have to realize that just because the suggestion doesn't work doesn't mean that there's not a problem there. If she's saying, oh, like in this in this book, there's a character that's a very beloved character who's kind of being a jerk a little bit. And she's just like, I feel like you need to soften that up. We, that's a very beloved character. They need to be nicer. And and I was just like, but no, he's in a dark place and he's angry and that's what he was doing. And, and as we were talking, she sort of said, okay, so maybe what it is is that you need to have your main character be more sympathetic then. Because if the, if the main character is understanding why that character is being that way, then we, the readers, will understand why that character is being that way. And it was like that aha moment of, oh yeah, so he could still be that way, which was true to his character, but I could also fix the issue, which was that it was making those scenes not very fun because we were irritated with him. And it was because I was having my main character also be irritated with him. And she's just like, maybe have your character have that, ha understand, give, him, give her a scene where she finally understands why he's doing this. And it was like, oh yeah. So it's sort of, it's maybe the specific suggestion, whether it be a critique partner or an editor or whoever, it doesn't work, but that doesn't mean that you can just be like, oh, don't have to do it. You know, it, there's usually still a problem there. And it's sort of up to you, the writer, to sort of figure out, okay, so, Again, what was I trying to go for? That that whole like writing the book that you thought you wrote the first time. It's so clear in your head, but it isn't always coming out that way on the page. I think my favorite editorial note is this or better. Or if you're yeah. Better. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, like it's like this is not the specific thing we want you to do. It's this or better, and you're mm -hmm. like better. What does that mean? I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, yeah. don't, don't make don't me come up with it. <laughs> yeah. But there's a really funny skit. I don't. Do you guys know which one? Where the guy's talking to his editor, and the editor's like. So, so not oh, yeah. this, yeah. but this, yeah. Yeah. But not this, but this, and it's like these crazy suggestions. Um, so, I, you just yes. Google not this, but this. It's yeah. hilarious. That's my life all the time. Isn't it like a Monty yeah. Python or so, yeah. something yeah. like that? It's so just yeah. hilarious. At the end of the day, sorry, one last thing. At the end of the day, it's your story. I mean, ultimately, it doesn't really. You know, if you're not getting along with your editor and you don't agree, at the end of the day, it's your story. It's your name on the book. So. The important thing, I think, is to have a good working relationship with your editor. Sorry, that's it. You've been very patient. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just really excited. Um, so I just read six. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. I mean, there was a couple other people that read it in here, and I was just saying, I'm like, I can't read The Drink in the Dark, and I was in, like, Gilbert, Arizona, and I was like, oh, my God, I live there. And I was like, okay. <laughs> So uh, I just had a question, and it goes, like, for everyone, how did you come up with, you know, like, your theme, you know, they're not zombies, you guys are actually, whatever, but, uh, <laughs> like, did you, based off of, like, characters, like, from your family, or, like, people you met, and you wanted to, like, kill them off, or... <laughs> okay, use the word theme, you mean the, the thematic elements of yeah. this? Oh, okay. Um, well, I, I was, I guess, taught or learned at some point that we are not in charge of theme, we're in charge of plot. Um, it is our job to sit down and write the best plotted novel that we possibly can, and then, um, and like we were talking about earlier, you don't go you know, set out like, I'm going to write a book about this issue, that'll teach you. I'm like, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Are you uh, sure? Uh, well, I've tried, not Just that I haven't tried. <laughs> yeah. um, but you do discover them. Um, so in Sick, yeah, there, were, there was all, depending on what angle you want to come at, there's, there's a racism thing, and then there's a, the overarching thing, you know, became about the other. How do you treat the other, whoever that is? You know, whether it's an age thing or a skin color thing or a um, or a zombie thing or um, socioeconomic class or whatever. There's also, if you really want to read into Chad's character, you could go into what's the comment on our military structure in this country. It's it's, it's not something I set out to do, yeah. but if you wanted to write a paper on it, you could. You know, kind of thing. But um, I think theme comes second okay. in the story. Yeah, I don't know. What do you guys? Usually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I don't base my characters on people that I know because I let really bad things happen to my characters. And <laughs> my friends are different than Suzanne's friends. My friends would be like, I'm never talking to you again. <laughs> so they would 
not find it cool. So I intentionally do. I like if if someone is starting to remind me of someone that I know, I'm like, oh, I better change that because uh, I let I let bad things happen to my characters. So yeah. Although yeah. I will I will add. Sorry. Uh, um, the uh, the teacher who gets killed in the beginning of, of the story, I, I knew I didn't want to use one of mine. It's like no, but I, I love Mrs. Tully. I'm like, I can't use it. So I went into the living room. My wife was in. I'm like, what was that English teacher you hated? Mrs. Golan. <laughs> Okay, so be careful when you become teachers, your kids. <laughs> Did that answer your question, Mike? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so you you guys have kind of already half answered my question um, through hers, but I mean, like, where do you get the idea? Like, do you just, like, see something and be like, this would be a really good idea for a book? Or do you just have, like, some weird dream where you wake up and it's like, i got to write about this. This could be a great book. Like, where do you get the idea? We have, I would, I would say, if, if I may, um, we all have filters. And, and what catches in my filter is not going to catch in Amy's filter or Amy's filter or, you know, so on and so forth. Um, <laughs> my, we were, again, wife story, because she's great. We were driving to California, and she asked me the same question. Where do you, why, why does your, why do our brains work this way and everybody else's work this other way? I was like, okay, well, it's like that, that burnt out bus we passed back there. It's like 50 yards off the road. Like, why is there a school bus 50 yards off the freeway and it's been burnt? Like, what happened? What is it? I have to know. So now I'm going to sit down and write a story about it just to fill in the blanks because I have no idea. And my wife said, what burnt out bus? <laughs> like, and there it is. <laughs> we, we have these things that just catch and we have to answer them. And I, I think it always starts with the what or the why. You know, you see something, you're doing something, you hear something, you think, what? Why? What if? And then, you know, from the what if, the book comes. So my book is about, I was, my kids, I was taking my kids in high school to get heart tested because they were having this event at the high school. Because when you, somebody drops dead, an athlete, it's generally because they have this heart condition. And so they were trying to, so anyway, so I'm bringing my kids to have this just to make sure everything's fine. And I started thinking, well, what if? What if? What if something wasn't right? What if, I mean, my kids are okay athletes, they're not super fabulous, but what if, <laughs> what if they were? What, you know, and, and so what if, what if it was me? What if my whole dream, my whole life was toward getting to swimming in the Olympics? And then what if I found out I had this heart condition and if I swim, I'm gonna die? And so as long as I can keep answering, asking that what if, and I don't really know, I can argue both the best, the best ideas for me, I can answer that question from both ends. So I can argue, well, yes, you should not have to give up your dream. I could see why she would want to still swim. But on the other hand, oh my God, does she want to lose her life too? Is a dream more important than a life? Or like, and that's it. Just so the things that happen to you guys in your day that make you think, what if? That really, those are I think were ideas for each of us. It's something different, and that's for me anyway. It's always something that's touched my life in some way. That's, yeah. Turns into an idea. I'll double on that. Um, this book is all about what ifs. It's a parallel universe story. Um, book one is in this world, book two is in this world. Um, and I've always been fascinated with, you know, what if I hadn't chosen this path? What if I had gone this way? Um, so this is all about a boy who gets to see what his life would have been like if, 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 if these other things had gone differently. Um, but that's what compels me is the what if. And I'll have it just, I think it's a matter of observ observing people and um, you know, news articles and just taking in information and, and asking those questions. Yesterday I was in the pickup line picking up my son from school and this whole novel just like dropped right in my head. <clears throat> and I got my phone and I'm taking notes and it was just like fully formed if I can get it on the, on the paper like that. But it was like, what if there's a boy and this happens and this girl and yeah, you just kind of follow him. Um, yeah, I think the problem for authors is not where do you get the ideas, but you get so, so many. many that, yeah, every time I'm writing a book, I come up with five more ideas for a novel, and so I have this file just full of plot ideas that I know I'll never be able to get to them all, and so you have to choose which ones you want to work on. Um, I do a lot of school visits for kids, and one of the things that I've noticed is kids you know, where you come up with a plot idea, and they, they have so much imagination and creativity, they never get stuck or blocked. And I always tell them that if I ever get writer's block, I just need to go stalk some children. <laughs> what if she got arrested? <laughs> I'm trying to explain no one in I know, no, that's... 
side note because you just distracted me. Um, <laughs> I do a lot of, uh, I have a dragon series that takes place in DC and there's a senator's daughters and, and so I'm researching flashbangs and armor and White House blueprints and oh, <laughs> so some. And last time I flew someplace, they were testing my hands for explosives yeah. and I would try to tell them, no, really, I don't even make dinner. <laughs> explosives, but I think I'm on a list now. Yeah. <laughs> we all are. Our yeah. author Google's yeah. history is really interesting, you yes. know? How do you kill people? Uh -huh. <laughs> when I was trying to visualize my characters for my middle grade, um, I, I was like, okay, so I need like to look at like cute 12 year old oh, no. boys. <laughs> I'm sure I'm on so many watch lists now, it's not even funny. Um, so don't do that. And uh, you know, I feel like, you know, I actually rarely, I, I, with Let the Sky Fall, I had that sort of moment where it was like, whoa, story idea. I keep waiting to sort of have that J.K. Rowling train moment where I conceptualize like s the seven book Harry Potter series in one four hour period of time. For me, my ideas are usually very tiny seedlings that a lot of times, they, for me, they sort of start as goals. Like I knew with, with this series that I wanted to write a, a fantasy story kind of like Harry Potter or Percy Jackson where I wanted the main hero to be a girl and where I wanted to not use magic. And I didn't know, I mean, that could be anything, but those were sort of my two goals. That, and it was just over time, little bits and pieces of the story would slowly fall into place. And the best thing for me that I took out of my college writing classes was that they had told us to keep an idea journal. And I remember being a little panicky when she, because she said she was gonna check it every week. And I kept thinking, I don't get ideas every week. How am I going to fill new pages? But that was what she was trying to teach us, was that, yes, you do. It, it may not be a seven book series, but you're getting little ideas and all those little like, oh yeah, I saw this guy in a crazy hat and or all, you know, all this stuff that you put down, those are ideas and you never know when they're going to come back. So whenever I am sort of getting stuck on a plot point or a world detail, I have this stack of idea journals that I flip through and it, let the sky fall came from that. I had written a sentence that, that I said, maybe I'll do something with Sylph someday. And that became my trilogy. So, I mean, it was just sort of like, you, you don't necessarily know that you have the gold that you're sitting on until other pieces sort of fall into place later, at least for me. I don't have like a tree out in my yard that's like the idea tree. I wish it did. <laughs> um, I, it would be right next to my money tree. Right? <laughs> so. I really like how Tom, who's not paying attention, was explaining it. <laughs> These filters that we have as you go throughout your day, and it's almost like the ideas are on your peripheral vision, and if you're looking specifically for an idea, you don't find it, but there's something over here that caught your attention, and you kind of have to like Like the dog it. from Up? Squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've now ruined her metaphor. <laughs> Grade. <laughs> I write middle grade, you know? And I also keep an idea file, so, you know, just newspaper articles, I'll rip them out, magazine articles. I love Pinterest. I have a lot of secret boards, so people don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> and just to start catalog cataloging your different ideas, and then it's interesting how they mesh together. So the idea for Cinderella's Dress, I was looking for a picture book for my daughter, this was years ago. And there is another book out there called Cinderella's Dress, and it's a you know just nice pink frilly cover of this girl sliding down a banister in a frilly dress called Cinderella's Dress. But the behind the banister, it's new, uh, wallpaper. I thought, well, that's not Cinderella. I think, oh, it's a modern story. Cinderella passed her dress down. How cool is this? And I opened it up, and it was just how the birds made her dress. I thought, oh, that idea is still out there. You know, so it was kind of in the peripheral of what I was thinking. So I grabbed that idea, and then. So where in history do I choose to focus it on? And I chose World War II because I had this other idea that I had ripped out of a, out of a book that talked about how um, women were not uh, allowed to be design window designers for department stores in the 1940s. Several reasons that they worked in close quarters with men, it was considered a, a very physical job, there were ladders and electricity, and, and the biggest thing was that it took place overnight, and women had a work curfew of 10 o'clock, at least in New York. So I thought, oh, all those things were sort of interesting and I'd never read that before. And so I kind of meshed these ideas together, came up with a character who wanted to be a window designer. World War II hits, all the men are gone, so now women can do other stuff and the book gets born. Um, 
My stories, especially the ones lately, um, are really personal to me. Um, they're from my own kind of um, experiences, and then it's fiction. I no longer put friends in the stories and kill them off. I stopped that in like ninth grade. Um, but but uh, I think the ideas are, um, they are, they're really personal. It's something that happened to me, and then I spin it out into another universe. Um, so with the program, I had started writing a contemporary story about a girl who had attempted suicide, and then when she returned to school, you know, everyone was kind of um, really cruel about it, and it's like, oh, you're going to go kill yourself now. And, um, and so I'm writing this contemporary story, but it, it wasn't working. Like, it, it was too sad. It was kind of one of those things where it was crueler than fiction normally would be, even though real life can be terribly cruel. Um, and so there was this believability problem. And, uh, and I was listening, to, I was watching TV as I was writing, and this commercial came on for antidepressants, and one of the side effects was may cause um, suicidal thoughts in teens and young adults. And I thought, wow, you know, if that's a side effect, um, like, is that acceptable? Like, is that an acceptable side effect for society? Um, what if, you know, that became an actual epidemic? And so that was kind of how the epidemic part of the story came in, and I was able to take that original personal idea. Um, the book's not about me, it was just like those emotions that I had gone through um, and was able to use those to put into a character to make them come to life. Um, so, so that's kind of what I've been doing, especially with the last few series, is something emotional that I can then attribute to another story so that it has that believability. Good. Riff on that for a second, do we have time? Yes. Yeah. We're good. Um, for those of you, and uh, kind of off track, but maybe not, I don't know, for those of you who are planning to be teachers, um, are, who are my, like, my junior high and high school, probably? Almost wow. everybody, that's why you're in a YA class. Okay, so, <laughs> not, a, not a writing topic necessarily, but I just want to make sure I say this, because otherwise I'll, I'll kick myself. Um, understand, please, right now, that um, you may very well be one of the last adults who can impact a kid's life. I'm here today and alive today probably because I had two high school teachers who gave a shit, a tremendous uh, amount of it as a matter of fact. <laughs> um, and, and it literally would not be here today if it wasn't for them. They still come to my book signings, like they will still show up and sit there like, Dolly Goldie, yay! You know? <laughs> I, still, I still want to impress them. I'm 40 years old, I want to impress Dolly Goldie. Um, and all of us, and not just at this table, but every young adult author I've ever met, and I'm sure Dr. B could probably back it up, take our job so seriously, um, and we take that age range so seriously. Um, and so A, thank you for doing what you're doing, because notice, well, I was gonna say none of us are teachers, I guess that's not entirely true. Uh, I couldn't do it, I could not teach, oh my gosh, no, couldn't do it. Um, but yeah, but we take we take this audience very seriously, and and so as you go out and, and are are getting um, teaching jobs and working with kids, please understand um, what they are going through and what they're bringing into your classroom. It's all the stuff we're writing about. It's one of the reasons we write about it. I think um, that's all. Just thank you for doing it, and, and be aware that those kids need you very very much. So that's all. Yeah. Other somebody have We have time for one more. One more. Okay. Cool. All the weight of the panel oh, is on um, your shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I mean, you touched on it a little bit um, as far as like focusing on the age range, but do you censor yourself? What, like, in terms of worrying about your book getting banned or there being controversial things in there, yeah. is that something you worry about while you're writing? I'll, you I'll pay anybody story? in here a hundred bucks yeah, to challenge can. one of my books in high school because the, the publicity would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that would be phenomenal. Um, I don't. I'm also, I, I go the opposite Jeanette route, um, and, and I, I talk the way me and my friends talk in my books. Although it is starting to, not as much as I used to um, before, because of the library problem, or because of the school problem. I cannot get into as many schools and as many libraries as I would like because they're, they're like, oh, swearing! No, I'm like, really? Okay. Uh, so anyway, um, but on a first draft, no, absolutely not. But, you know, I had a kind of a different, when I, my first book was coming out, um, the main character was 15, and so it was supposed, it was going to be a young adult, and then they said, you know what, I didn't have any bad languages in it anyway, but they said, you know, we, we think this should be more middle grade, so we, all the, the crap, every time you said the word crap, you need to take that out of your book, because that's too, we can't have that for middle school. <laughs> Oh, okay. So I I was shocked that 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 they found the publisher found that that word to be, uh, you know, had to had to come out. So I I redid I went through the whole book. I took it all out, and then they said, Oh, you know what? We changed our mind, marketing people. We really feel like this book is young adult. So put the crap back in. <laughs> so we need to get you a T-shirt. <laughs> <I know. laughs> So 
I think that they're, depending on what you're writing, for what age, um, where they want, you know, if it's going to be, I had a book that was going to be a scholastic book club book, and then there are certain rules about what's acceptable for that. So I think what, as I write, I just try to write without any censors as my characters, but then you would be surprised the actual business part of it, they may, you know, it has reared its head for me anyway. I, I had a scene in my the second book, follow up, um, focuses on the other world and, and this boy, the other boy who gets moved. He's he, in, it's very confusing to talk about parallel universes. Um, so in his world, he is in a foster home and it's not a good one. And and as I was writing the second book, there's a there's this moment where he considers getting a gun. And I and I wrote it and I sent it off my editor and she didn't see anything. And then it came back and I was like, wait a second, you know what am I? What am I doing? And so I censored myself. I thought I don't want to have a situation where a kid actually considers that. So especially with you know in the news, it was there was had recently been a shooting, and I thought, oh gosh, I don't want to I don't want to have that on my hands at all. So I do some self self censoring, um, but now I'm scared about language because I didn't know that about libraries and schools. <laughs> There's not a lot of language in here, but there are some words. Um, I've actually had a lot of from my editor censoring, which you wouldn't think because I'm pretty G-rated and stuff. So um, I had, a, like, I made fun of Disney Snow White collar in a book, and my editor's like, we cannot make fun of Disney. <laughs> oh, I was like, okay. So, so I mean, yeah, that, there was, um, in, in Just One Wish, um, there was a girl, she's sneaking onto a set by pretending to be a animal wrangler, and there's a snake. And it gets away during the scene. And um, one of the reviewers, who is a big name in the um, publishing industry, wrote back and said she wouldn't blurb my book because that was animal cruelty. That snake was like lost on the set, and we couldn't have that. That was irresponsible. And I, I, I said to my editor, "Can I just write a note in the beginning of the book that says no animals were <laughs> <laughs> the writing of this book?" But no, we had to find the snake and bring it back to the pet store and stuff. Um, so yeah, it was. There's some, there some weird things like that that you wouldn't think. Religion, also, my editors try and rip out anything. Like one of them takes place during the Middle Ages. Of, Incompetent fairy godmother sends them back to the Middle Ages, and she didn't want any mention of the Catholic Church. It was like that's <laughs> historical. Yeah. They were Catholic back then, you know. I'm not. It's not like pro-Catholic or anything. It's just that's. How, but yeah, it's like nope. There's no more Catholics in the Middle Ages. So yeah, it's 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 weird. Like that, but you wouldn't think. Yeah, I. I think I must self-censor. Um, I've never had anything with my YA at all, but I did. I did sort of keep in mind that the fact that I was having my middle grade come out first, and I would very much have readers who would transition over. So I did sort of. But it was also the world of it. It's a world where a single kiss bonds you together forever. So you kind of take that first kiss a little bit seriously. And it was, you know, the main character, he just, he didn't swear, and it just, I mean, he has a few dance and stuff, but that was about the worst that he ever said, and it wasn't like I was sitting there saying, like, no, not, you will not use that word, it just, he just was that way. Um, in my middle grade, I had to, um, I had to take out um, a, a mention to swearing. Like, I, I had a character who was like, if I would have been swearing if I were you, and they said that they didn't want that. But I thought it was funny because I can get away with as much violence as I want in my middle grade. That's what I'm always worried about. I'm always like, you know, there's the scene where she gets kidnapped and he burns her, and is that too much for little kids? They're like, oh, that's fine. But that character that said, like, I'd be swearing, that we've got to take out. <laughs> what a double standard. <laughs> so, yeah, anyway. <laughs> as, as we give a final round, as we give a final round of applause for Dr. Matsunaga, Doctors Duran and Clark Oates and the panel, let's include oh. Lois Brown, who is a host to the stars. <laughs> she picks up celebrities and gets them where they need to go. And she's kind of like Jason Statham, you know. <laughs> so let's give them all up.